Dear all, welcome to one more library talk, a joint organization of the Anamet Library and Tarikh Vakfi, the History Foundation. I am Vasya Mule, the head librarian of the Anamet Library, and today we are very pleased to host Ivana Yevtich and Koray Durak, who will present the most salient perspectives included in their publication, Identity and the Other in Byzantium. Stemming from the fourth international Sevgigenul Byzantine Study Symposium, the articles in the book offer new textual, archaeological, and art historical material that is necessary for a fuller understanding of Byzantine construction on the self and other in its various, uh, various dimensions. Ivana Yevtich received her PhD from the University of Sorbonne and the University of Freiburg, and she's currently an assistant professor at Koch University at the Department of Archaeology and History of Art. Her main research concerns the reception of the antique tradition and the development of the narrative mode in late Byzantine arts and aesthetics. She also explores the phenomenon of reuse, spoliar, and the artistic and architectural development of late medieval art centers, especially in Constantinople. She is currently working on a monograph about monumental art and wall paintings of Byzantine Constantinople. Koray Durak is Associate Professor in the Department of History at Boazic University. His main areas of research interest include Byzantine and medieval and Islamic trade, representation of the other in Byzantine and Arabic literature, and geographical imagination in the early Middle Ages. He is currently working on a monograph on exchanges and communications between Byzantine and Islamic Near Eastern in the early Middle Ages. Before we start, I would like to mention that all participants' microphones and cameras have been turned off, and this session is being recorded. You're very welcome to place your questions uh, using the chat option, and the speakers will reply back once they are done with the talk. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Vasiliki, for the introductions. Uh, and uh, I, we thank all the people who are online for coming and listening to us. Uh, Ivana, would you like to say something? Yes, I'm joining uh, you in thanking everyone for being uh, with us uh, this evening. Thank you. Well, I will start with uh, first uh, share screening my sh uh, sh sharing my screen. Uh, to start our journey. Uh, as you know, we are going to be talking about the book that we, Ivan and I, edited uh, in 2019 uh, called Identity and the Other in Byzantium, which was the product of the fourth international Sevgigenul symposium. Well, it all started in 2007 when the first Sevgigenul uh, Byzantine Studies Symposium uh, was established, was started. Uh, before that, there were a number of smaller conferences or attempts to organize a larger conference in Turkey. For example, under the uh, guidance of Sevgi Gönül and the Sad Museum uh, in 1994, uh, there was an attempt to organize a conference about Byzantine history, roughly about the subject from Constantine, about Byzantine history from Constantine to Fatih. But somehow in 1994, the circumstances were not that favorable uh, for having a conference on Byzantine history in 1990s in Turkey. So the conference was canceled. Um, well, as you know, there are a number of conferences since then being organized, some of them um, much shorter, not repeated, uh, and only one of them. Sevgi Gönül Symposium being repeated every three years. I'm not going to go one by one uh, through the other conferences held in Turkey. Here are three examples. Since 1997, there is the um, International Symposium on Medieval and Turkish Period Excavations and uh, Art History, as you see on the left. And uh, let me make my present our presentation larger. Here we go. And uh, there is also the conference, there was also a conference uh, organized in 2016 at Boğaziçi University, Byzantine Studies in Turkey, hopefully to be repeated uh, in the coming years. Uh, and also some, uh, not only at a very uh, professional level, but at the graduate level, uh, a, conf a graduate forum 
first forum organized in 2020 at Bilkent University uh, with collaboration with the Koch University, Boğaziçi and Hacettepe Universities. So as you see here on the chart, the, this our book uh, was the product of the fourth Sevgünet Symposium, but the fifth one has already been organized in 2019. So the book for the fifth in the, uh, symposium uh, is on the is, is being produced. Well, this is a number of images from the conference. For the, the conference series were first organized, uh, held at the uh, Istanbul Archaeological Museums, but later uh, at Anamet in Taksim. And obviously, as I told you, uh, every uh, with every conference was born uh, a book. So started as proceedings and then continued as selected papers. Now. Uh, this is the poster of the fourth International Sevgilinism and Studies Symposium, as you see here from 2016. Uh, we should, of, of course, thank the FB Koch uh, and the Honorary Chairman Amar Koch for contributing to the organization of these conferences and the publication. And there is a scientific committee, an advisory board, and also executive board uh, involved in the uh, conceptualizing first the, the conference and then implementing it, and also in, in involved in the uh, production of the book itself. I guess almost like this is from the Siklitz's manuscript. I, I feel like when we met in Anamet, the scientific committee and, and whether by advisory or executive, uh, having intense discussions and also lots of cookies and, and croissant uh, with coffee, uh, I, it felt like we were you know, almost like in this picture exchanging ideas uh, and books. Well, uh, how was it born, the idea, to talk about identity and other in Byzantium? Obviously, as you know, Turkey has been in an identity crisis in the neutral sense, or in searching, searching for its soul uh, in the last few decades. Um, therefore, it was quite in our mind when we, one of, one of us said, let's talk about identity in Byzantium. Uh, and especially even today, when many groups are otherized in Turkey in the name of unity, the subject itself, identity and otherness or otherization becomes more imminent. imminent. So I guess uh, the subject of the book is still very relevant. Of course, we historians do not write only history through presentist concerns. We historians are also part of the larger social historical, so, so, sorry, social scientific trends. As you know, since the postmodern and cultural turn in 1980s in social sciences, historians, sociologists, anthropologists have been very interested in subjects, I mean, people perceiving themselves and presenting themselves. So these are sociological and historical subjects, I mean people, both now and in the past, uh, their self-perception, their self-presentation, and therefore their identity of them, uh, perception of themselves and perception of others have become very popular in social scientific fields. So outside or next to traditional identity definitions like class or nation or religion, we have had in the last 40 years, it has been a long time, by the way, in the last 40 years, since, since 2000, since 1980s. I mean, you know, I used to say in the last 20 years, and I say now in the last 40 years, we're getting older. So anyway, uh, not only class or nation-based definitions of identity, but also um, the definitions based on cultural uh, categories have become very popular. Now, of course, when we think about identity, almost in a Hegelian manner, we think about the other in a dialectical manner. So when one thinks about oneself, one thinks about the other and vice versa. Anyway, so that was the beginning of the genesis of the topic, identity and the other. So uh, papers presented uh, in the summer of 2016 explored the following topics. The other, especially in geographical and ethnic imagination. And the other, as I uh, made bold, an image of the universe, the one we uh, live in, and the image of the other world, that is to say heavens and hell and paradise, encounter with an appropriation of the other and exotic, especially in the material culture, and perception of the past, whether it's pagan or Christian. 
And the whole, this whole endeavor resulted in, as you see here, in two products. One was an exhibition uh, curated by Professor Anthony Eastman at Anamed, uh, and with a book as, a, as an end result on Trebizond in general, and more specifically, uh, San Ace, uh, Agio Sophia of, uh, of the 13th century and later. And as you see to the right, the book itself, the, the selected papers from the conference. Uh, how the book was made, born and made, I'd like to leave the floor to, for it to Ivana. Yes, thank you, Koray. So maybe we can move to the next slide. Yes, how was, so you heard how the symposium, the idea of the symposium was shaped. And uh, once the symposium ended, uh, the idea of the book was then started slowly put in place. So um, it's, the book is a, is a collective volume. Uh, so it has a selection of papers from the conference. And um, although in scholarly world, uh, collective volumes are not always uh, maybe valued as their right justice, right value, uh, the advantage of a collective volume like this one is that it brings papers from authors who are all uh, having various background, uh, working in very different fields. Therefore, uh, on a, such a complex topic as identity and the other, uh, this collective volume was an appropriate initiative because it voiced several approaches, not just one single approach or one single point of view. Um, another aspect that is interesting, so the book was a collective volume, but the work and the working process and how it was made was also a collaborative project. Uh, and it co embodies the collaboration of, uh, of Koch University and Boazic University, their Byzantine research centers, and also uh, the, all of you who, who like books, uh, who may work around books, whether you are reading them, producing them, translating them, publishing, editing, uh, selling them, there is, uh, there is a lot of work around books. And uh, sometimes that work is not, uh, not, there is not opportunity to mention it. Uh, so that, um, that's why I would like to really to thank all of those who contributed to the process of bookmaking from designer Burak Shushut to graduate students of Coach University, many of our colleagues. And indeed the book you can, if you're interested, it's a book you can buy uh, at several points uh, actually in, uh, in, in Istanbul. So, um, one, one aspect that I would like to, uh, to, to single out is that making of a book is, of course, very demanding, but it is inspiring and creative. Uh, and the one anecdote uh, that uh, can tell you how, how we, we made the book, so once we received the contribu contributions of all authors, of course, the question was, how do we, how we would structure that book uh, and make different papers and different materials relate to each other and maybe be a dialogue in dialogue across the book. And that's always very challenging. So uh, Korai came up with an idea. Uh, he, brought, uh, he brought a lot of papers of different colors. And as we were reading the articles, uh, we were actually on every paper, you know, putting the name of the author, singling out the main concepts from hers or his article. And then we were playing around. We would, for instance, take one concept that we see appearing in several articles, and then we would play with colors and papers and say, maybe with this concept, we could put together these and these contributions or then we would say maybe we could change it. So just to give you a sense of how actually creative processes like bookmaking are, uh, can be actually very, very playful and uh, very inspiring. 
so with all my thanks to all those who contributed uh, to the book, uh, the book was, uh, was finalized and published then in uh, 2019. So Kurai, shall we attack now the, the content of the book? Yes, we, will, we actually are doing it. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, great. So uh, now I'm taking over again. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, in my share of time now, uh, before Ivana speaks again, I'd like to talk about the concepts of identity and other nursing Byzantine studies. Uh, giving you a small tour of the state of the scholarship before we talk about the content of the book a little bit. Uh, but from the perspective of a historian, I, mean, I know, and you know, that the division between fields, uh, subfields like art history, history, and, um, and archaeology, uh, the divisions are a bit, you know, uh, passé. Uh, and they don't hold true. But still, since I am more focusing on the written material and since Ivana is focusing on more on the material culture and art historical ev evidence, we divided the, the, the discussion of the uh, book and the field um, along these lines. Now, uh, I will start with identity and finish with other. Uh, first, starting with the concepts within the Byzantine studies field and within our book. Now, obviously, you know, when they say identity or kimlik in Turkish or huviyet in Turkish, the first thing that comes to mind is a personal identity and even a personal identity card, kimlik card, right? Obviously, uh, the, when we look at, sorry, Yurisay Vilsa's identity card, uh, we think of her as a number of things. Other, for example, woman, a Turkish citizen, Istanbul, maybe, and her occupation, um, uh, etc. Of course, what she thinks of herself, other than the, just, uh, the first few identity uh, definitions I gave about her, might be quite different. So the same questions can be asked about the Byzantines themselves. These so-called peasants, Georgi, as you see at the lower level, uh, working on the field, uh, Ampelo, Ampelos, uh, actually, we instantly call them peasants, but was it their only identity? And did they really call themselves peasants as a collective entity? Uh, identity ca carries a, a, a different levels of definition. There is the philosophical definition of identity as an issue of sameness and difference. Identity can be psychological, an individual trait, right? As self and other. Uh, and it, identity can be a, a, a social uh, definition like Turks or Istanbulites or women. So our focus has been on the social definition of identity. And if I talk through the levels of identity at the universal level, the human identity, it is a species definition. Like we are different from the animals or non-living entities as human beings. That's the largest definition of our identity, I guess. We are human beings. Now, obviously, Maya Kominko's article in our book, when it focused on the difference or similarities between the humans, Christian human beings, and monstrous races, like Kinokefali, dog-headed people, there, there was a, you know, a reference to this level, universal level, the humans and half humans and animals. The individual level, as you see at the, uh, number three, is obviously based on the idea that no person is like the other. We are each unique with our fingerprints, but we don't talk about the individual level in this book that we edited. We are more focused on the social level, the identity differences based on age, ability, gender, location, occupation, class, race, sexual orientation, economic status. Uh, identity categories can be created in diets, that is to say in twos, mother and the son, a female with a baby has a mother identity and the, the other baby has a child identity. Uh, it can be in small groups. I can be, in, as an academic, as Korai, I'm a member of the academic social groups and more specifically, Boazici academic social group. So it's a small group, but still larger than diet. And much larger collectives, such as me being Istanbul or from Turkey or Turk, however you want to call yourself. 
So in that sense, there are different levels. Uh, duration, it can be short-lived. That is to say, being a member of the deem of the Greens in 6th century Constantinople, you can change you know, member affiliation with football teams and also deems in Constantinople. It can be a bit longer, but still temporary, like you're a Byzantine pilgrim going to uh, the Holy Land, uh, Jerusalem. It is not a community, it's a temporary communitas. Therefore, it's temporary. But also, there are also those identities whose duration is almost lifelong, being Christian or being a woman in the, in the Byzantine context uh, is almost universal, is almost forever, unless you take great pains to change your womanness or your Christianity. Intensity of the identification is also important. And there, of course, the concept of affiliation comes in, in Turkish mensubiyet. Like how much connected you feel to that identity. That especially, it is becomes, affiliation becomes, or uh, amount of affiliation or belonging you feel towards something becomes very important, let's say, when you talk about a person, a Byzantine man, deciding to become a monk. Why does he decide to cut his belonging, cut his affiliation with the secular world and decide to go into a monastery? Or a Byzantine person, this woman, deciding to become a Muslim in the late Byzantine period? You know, so the levels of belonging to the new religion and levels of declining levels of belonging to the old religion are worth studying for historians. Conformity also is another concept we should think about. Group membership involves conformity. How much did a Byzantine peasant conform to the accepted traditional role of a peasant or a Byzantine woman, to the accepted definition of Byzantine woman? Whatever the society imposes on her, how much of it she, she conformed to? Uh, or a Europeans at the Byzantine court, how much Byzantinized were they when they stayed in Byzantine court for five years? A French nobleman staying in the Byzantine court for five years, or Orhan uh, staying in Constantinople before its capture or taking by the, or conquest by the Ottomans. Uh, of course, that we should make a difference between avowed versus ascribed identity. That is to say, what you think of yourself is your avowed identity. What the others define you, how the others define you, is an ascribed identity. So we hear about many subgroups in Byzantium through their ascribed identities, such as Polishians, this heterodox religious group. We have very little about them. Many pagan groups in late antique period are written only from the perspective of Christian, uh, dominant Christian discourse. And finally, how would you identify identity of a person or a group? The collective traits that they shared as a group, the language, accent, words uttered, physical traits, clothing, right? I mean, what can I say when I say Turk? Is it the Tespih? Is it the, the daily dancer? Is it the Lokum? Or as we see in the Flash TV in the past, is it all of these three personified in the case of Flash TV shows? Is it really the popular Turkish culture and its individual traits put in the same basket? Right? So, the Byzantinists in the 20th century worked on identity. Uh, Kajdan and Constable in 1982 came up with the definition of Homo Byzantinus. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but that was the first attempt, in a sense, a sociological attempt to define a Byzantine collective identity, man on the street, Byzantine man on the street. Obviously, when we talk about Byzantium, we think about Hellenic identity, Roman identity, and Christian identity coming together. It's almost like you know uh, the most common thing to say about Byzantium. Uh, and of course, the, the, the roles that these three items played in, this, in defining Byzant the Byzantine changes according to historian. And therefore, it's almost like a cocktail, ingredients of which are clear, is uh, Hellenic, Christian, and Roman. And you play around with, the, with, with it. And you have, as you see here, uh, two works, two war works in 1990s that focused on Byzantine identity, but this is the biggest Byzantine collective identity. That is to say, who is a Byzantine? The biggest element, like who is a Turk, who is an American? So the, we're not talking about subcategories of identities, like women, Byzantine Armenians, Byzantine women, Byzantine uh, urbanites or villagers, but this is who is a Byzantine person? 
these two works you see uh, contained articles that focus on the Greek or Hellenic identity within the Byzantine identity, or talk about other identities like Armenians and Arabs and Slavs compared to Byzantine identity. Um, now, speaking of the Byzantine identity, recently, in the 2000s, actually in the last few years, there is a lively debate about the Byzantine identity itself. Who are the Byzantines? I'm not going to go into details too, but it's worth taking notes of Caldelis, and especially Caldelis and uh, Stratus, because there's a debate between them, uh, whether uh, the Byzantine identity uh, was a national identity, if I may say, and the amount of Romanness uh, in it, and the Hellenic role of Hellenic identity in this Roman nation, because Caldelis calls the Byzantines as the Roman nation of the East, almost like a nation state because traditionally we call the Byzantine state as a multi-ethnic empire. So he's like, you know, uh, inviting us to think about these things. Not that I agree with or disagree, but... So, you see here slowly in 1990s and 2000s, next to the larger umbrella term of Byzantines, you have a, a number of works now focusing on subgroups, if I may say, such as in, in Cavallo's Byzantines, there was an article on women, on bureaucrats, on the poor. And as we move on to 2010, in the com in a companion to Byzantium by this James, you have uh, a much more different categories of identities. Husbands, children, eunuchs, young people. As you see, there's a shift from traditional categories of identity uh, to more explorative ones. The shift is clear, especially with, as I said, the cultural turn and post-colonial uh, turn in, in 1980s and 90s. Likewise, just one single example, the bibliography on uh, gender in Byzantium by Dambert Knox was called Bibliography on Woman in 1980s. Now it has changed. It, has, it is called Bibliography on Gender in Byzantium, and it includes, it is supplemented by studies on eunuchs, and it is a concern for masculinity. Therefore, it doesn't study anymore the bibliography. It doesn't include only works uh, on women, but it, were, it uh, contains works that explore the gender system in Islam. Lastly, with the post-structuralist perspective, the question of the self uh, and self-representation uh, has provided Byzantinists with necessary tools to deconstruct the author, the Byzantine author's identity. Therefore, in this 2014 book, uh, the author in the Middle Byzantine literature, there are writers here exploring how Byzantine authors presented the subject I as author. So as you see, right from the title of a very recent book, the identities are now seen as liquid and multiple for individuals and for aggregates. Therefore, this is the recent uh, state of the uh, scholarship on identity. Very shortly, for the other, obviously, as I said, the definition of the other goes along with definition of the outsider, foreign, and stranger. Uh, different cultural, uh, economic, uh, legal definitions of the other. Um, when you study the self, you study the other. And when you study the other, you can find things about yourself. Therefore, it's also true for the Byzantines. Uh, Byzantine studies, modern studies, are not that rich uh, on the subject of otherness and authority as it is for the subjects of identity. Um, almost the only famous collective work I can cite is Diane Smythe's 2000 uh, edited volume, Byzantine outsider. Next to the traditional categories of otherness in terms of class, ethnicity, gender, and religion, the writers in this volume talk about talk through polarities such as nature versus culture, Constantinopolitan versus provincial, literary insiders, and literary outsiders. So, what is our book about? Exactly about these subjects I covered. It's the platform to study the relationship between the self and the other. Um, and uh, how to hear of the voice of the suppressed other. Maybe that's kind of the 
uh, original contribution of this book from historian's perspective and also from art historian's perspective. I'm sure Ivan will talk about this because it's very difficult to hear the voice of the other, of the subaltern, of the suppressed, because the history is written by the victors, as you know. So it's you, historians and art historians have to go through the material culture or written evidence through very different means and mechanisms in order to give voice, an attempt, not a success, to the suppressed. And there are articles in this book, art historical and historical, that are uh, actually quite uh, trying to attempt, uh, accomplish this attempt. So I'm not, I don't, I just, I'm sure I talked too much uh, already. Uh, beyond almost 20 minutes, but just very shortly and uh, to present humbly some of the articles uh, from the book, from the historical perspective. Uh, the first three books, uh, sorry, articles are approaching the issue of identity and otherness through the ethnic definitions, the most traditional and the most commonsensical uh, definition of identity for a modern mind, not universally. Uh, Tony Caldelis in Ethnicity and Clothing looks at uh, how the Byzantines saw their dress as identity markers. So uh, he sees uh, quite a common homogeneity from Italy to Trebizond in the way Byzantine sources describe Roman dress. As I said, this is discourse, this is not reality. Maybe it was reality, but at least we should underline the fact that this is as argued by Byzantine authors, uh, a homogeneous uh, a unity about Byzantine dress. And of course, these authors also describe other people's costumes or, or you know, garments in a very simplified manner. Turkish dress, Russian dress, Arabic dress. Obviously, the real life was, was, was probably much more different. Nicolas Stolange looks at the Byzantine Jewish other. Uh, uh, he tries to uh, you make use of the Greek sources and how the Greek sources saw Jews uh, in different light through physiognomy, through clothing, through language and religious practices. But he pays uh, attention, he draws attention to the fact that Jews were not a monolithic entity. There were Rabbinite Jews, there were Karaite Jews in Byzantium. Therefore, even though our sources invite us to see Jews as a monolith, actually Jews represented themselves, different Jewish groups as represented themselves differently. And also these identities, ethnic identities tend to change. Both Caldelis and Delange try to show us how these identities through dress or through Jewish picture changed in time in Byzantium. Mayakovinko's article is also a case in point. It talks about the ethnographic descriptions of foreign people by Byzantines. And she says in the classical Greek, Roman and late Antic period, you have these monstrous races like Kinokephali, as you see here. But with Christianity, becoming the dominant discourse, you don't have any more semi-human, semi-animal entities, because humanity uh, in the Christian discourse is one entity, explaining away fantastic races with heads there on their shoulder, on their bosoms, or with dog heads. Well, thanks to the spatial turn, space, space studies, Mekan Sal Çalışmalar in Turkish, uh, we Byzantines pay more attention to let's say monastic space separated from city space, or Muslims not being allowed to enter churches in Constantinople in the, let's say 10th century, or the emperor's residence being a, dip, a kind of a, like a sacred place difficult to enter. So we are more conscious of space as historians and art historians. Along similar lines, desert were, uh, deserts were liminal spaces. And there were not only liminal spaces that is to say on the frontier at the beginning with the gate of another world, but they were also the uh, sites of oppositions such as settled versus nomadic, arid and fertile, and civilized and uncivilized. That's what Arietta Papa Constantino is studying in her article, The Desert and the City. So also, likewise, Uket Tapci Bayri explores in her article what kind of an identity was attributed to those martyrs, to those Christians who were martyred in outside Byzantine lands? Like, like the Christians, former Byzantine subjects who live now or then, who live then under Turks in Anatolia, then martyred. So what kind of an identity did they claim to have? Were they Romans? Were they only Christians? Did they call themselves or define themselves by their patris, their homeland? And what did the sources talk about? 
Uh, how, well, how did the sources talk about them? Because again, or unfortunately, we have the Constantinopolitan-centered sources talking about the neo-martyrs. Therefore, do we hear the voice of the martyrs? Do we hear the voice of Constantinopolitan uh, discourse? And uh, likewise, finally, like space, time also uh, is a significant aspect for the formation of identity and otherness. How past is remembered and reused and, and represented to us every time, every decade, every century changing is an interesting case. That's what Rustam Shukurev does in his work. He looks at the Byzantine concepts of Iran, but there were many Irans. The ancient Iran of the ancient Greeks and Byzantines knew it. Contemporary Iran, Persia, of the contemporary Byzantines, obviously Byzantines knew it. And also the Byzantines also have another group of Persians, even though they weren't Persians, Turks of Anatolia were called Persians. So how did a Byzantine intellectual in his mind, when he thinks or when he writes and when he uh, talks to people, negotiate between these three definitions of Persians, per ancient Persians, contemporary Persians, and Turkish Persians, or Persian Turks? So, I mean, it's very interesting to see how Byzantines were almost very much at ease, like postmodern people, about these contradictory, so-called contradictory discourses about these three worlds. Now, I think I talked too much, so uh, sorry, Ivana. Uh, I'm leaving the floor again to you, uh, and I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> thank you, Karai. No, thank you for this brilliant uh, historiographical overview uh, and uh, the perspective uh, from uh, historical studies. So um, now, uh, when it comes to concepts of identity and otherness in studies of Byzantine art, architecture and material culture. Well, I, although I'm an, I'm, I'm an art historian, I must say that in, when it comes to uh, these concepts, uh, uh, Byzantine art history is slowly taking off. Um, so many publications that uh, Korai referred to uh, from let's say 80s and 90s, uh, art historical evidence, material culture were maybe just mentioned uh, occasionally, but they were never really the focus of uh, very serious uh, questioning and study. So not that uh, Byzantine visual and material culture is not giving us material uh, and sufficient uh, clues to think of identity in the other, more that because of uh, various reasons, uh, scholars of art and architecture, material culture were not necessarily for quite some time asking these questions and trying to read those clues. Uh, so um, one book that uh, for me, for instance, was instrumental in bringing together art and identity is uh, the monograph of Anthony Ismond. Uh, dedicated to the study of Hagia Sophia in Trebizond, you see published in 2004. So this was really one very first effort uh, to approach a monument. So its makers, its users, its space, uh, its architectural shape, its architectural decoration beyond just, you know, typologies, classifications, descriptions, identification, but really trying to understand what does this monument, uh, how was this monument implicating the viewers? How was it expressing the identities? And also how maybe it participated in uh, contributing actually in making the identities or maybe articulating the identities of those who used, who were in that, uh, in, in who, for, who, who used uh, Hagia, Hagia Sophia in uh, Trebizond. So um, actually when it comes to uh, Byzantine art, one has to wait for 21st century uh, to see uh, the rise of uh, articles and publications that look at this concept in, uh, in, in visual and material culture. You may ask why, why such a delay? Um, various reasons. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe because um, scholars of art and architecture um, for a long time 
were bound by certain traditional views of what Byzantine art was. Uh, and and suffer, there, was, there was a need of actually to deconstruct uh, this perception of uh, Byzantine art, uh, its culture as something very homogeneous, a dominant culture uh, that was you know, so centered on its capital city, Constantinople, 20th century uh, iconographical, uh, let's say the contribution of iconographic studies very much pointed out these elements of you know, durability of Byzantine traditions, uh, its sense of permanence and order, almost something unchanging. And that often reminds me uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, a, of a saying uh, of a French uh, Byzantine historian, Paul Le Merle, who said that to think of Byzantium as never changing is actually to fall in a trap that Byzantines themselves set. So in a certain sense, maybe generations of art historians may have fallen in a certain trap uh, of, uh, of uh, accepting uh, certain constructions of identity, uh, like Roman heritage, Hellenism, Christianity as block identities, um, without necessarily trying to see, to understand through visual and material evidence, what really Roman heritage or Hellenism or orthodoxy, what did they really mean to people? and how people were articulating through their production, uh, through, through interaction they had among themselves as users, makers, clients, artists at the end, something extremely material, shared, commissioned, paid for. So how were all of these blocks uh, and concepts actually how were they? How were they functioning? How were they connecting people, defining people, and that is a process that, let's say, in general, to my to my mind, uh, Byzantine art history needed that time. Uh, certainly, I think that developments in art history in general, more of a theoretical theoretical broadening of art history, to which uh, developments in contemporary art. Uh, contributed a lot. Uh, also, uh, developments in cultural studies in general, uh, comparative literature, critical theory, uh, all of them impacted uh, art historical disciplines. And eventually, they also impacted uh, the, the, the history of, uh, of, uh, of Byzantine art and uh, made, um, made the art historians, uh, let's say, uh, more aware uh, of, uh, of, again, multiple, multiple faces of uh, Byzantium uh, that for which we have quite a lot of uh, evidence uh, that Byzantium was, uh, was certainly far from being never changing. It was a vibrant uh, culture uh, with many, many traditions, this cultural diversity comes up more and more in the writings about art and material culture. Uh, and um, Byzantine civilization and its identities are now seen more as, uh, as, as not fixed and homogeneous, but more as uh, open to to changes in time and space and to actually negotiations. So when you look, for instance, to more recent publications in the last past 10 years, you will simply understand that uh, Byzantine art history opened itself to a much more complex understanding of art as a phenomena, so all this phenomenological approach. And uh, on the other hand, uh, more attentive, more attentiveness towards various forms of artistic dialogues that Byzantium had uh, within the entire territory of this Byzantine world, not just Constantinople, and also uh, Byzantium and our surrounding, surrounding cultures. These yield now much more interesting uh, material that all brings us actually to the questions of, uh, of then 
uh, identities and uh, of course what were these other sides this uh, uh, where, where we see this otherness in the Byzantine world through visual and material culture. So uh, could I can you just move to the next slide? So some examples uh, from, from the book, actually the book gives you uh, interesting and new material. Uh, and I, I insist and Korai pointed that out, uh, that uh, it is the first time that uh, these topics are approached on the basis of, uh, of art historical uh, material, archaeological, epigraphical evidence. And that's, I think, a great contribution of the, of the book. Of course, the focus, particular focus is on Anna Anatolia, and that explains actually, that's very much part of the mission of the Sevgi Gunu Symposium in general. So uh, some interesting perspectives on identity in Byzantium from, from the book. Uh, the concern how identities, uh, identities are not fixed, they change over time and also they change in, in space or various spatial dimensions. Uh, so for instance, uh, one interesting contribution, uh, the one done by uh, Pamela Armstrong, uh, uh, was a question, was a, was a questioning of how actually cults of Christian saints, and she looked at two saints, St. Christopher and St. George, uh, two very popular warrior saints, she, she looked at actually how their cults were distributed, spread, how they developed, both in the Byzantine and actually also in Western medieval worlds. And, uh, and also how their, their ethnicity, whether fictive ethnicity or, uh, or, or real ethnicity, as they were all former Roman soldiers, how it may have affected actually the development of, uh, of, of, their, of their cult. And uh, she questions actually, or she, she allows us uh, to think in, in more precise terms, actually, to what point Byzantine world and orthodoxy was actually inclusive or not inclusive, and what filters actually were used when it comes to something so important as the spread of religious uh, cultures. And here you have uh, uh, one, one rare example, it's a clay icon that shows us actually St. Christ Christopher and George all together uh, in, one single, uh, in, one single, in one single image. Um, the question of this otherness uh, was accurately brought up uh, by Gunder Varignolo uh, in her effort to conceptualize Byzantine islands. Uh, so one other <laughs> par excellence in a contrast, so in contrast to, to mainland, so this polarity between the island, this isolated parcel of land in the sea, and it's uh, so separated, physically separated, but even most importantly, mentally also separated from the shore, from the mainland, and how actually uh, this, this bipolarity and how you move from the island to the mainland and backwards, which is crossing over, uh, how actually it, what kind of role that played in conceptualizing islands and also in in how islands and the islands she was working, like Dana or Boschak Islands, uh, became very significant pilgrimage spots and their role in, in bringing uh, holiness. Um, other aspects uh, that also include uh, identity uh, over time uh, is the contribution of Lee Jones, who looked at one single monument, I think very known to many of you uh, from Cappadocia here in the village Chavushin. It's a really well known 10th century church known as Pigeon House Church uh, at a group of portraits, ruler portraits on the northern wall and apse. But she did not look at them from the point of view of identification. 
tr but try to imagine the perception and, and how the viewer would, what kind of identities would the viewer associate with these uh, royal figures, knowing uh, how their lives evolved, how uh, the emperor Nikiforos Phokas, how he died, how he became from an emperor, then emperor, what happened afterwards. So the viewer would know uh, the life story actually of these rulers whose image is fixed in time, but the identity uh, that the viewer would associate with those images would actually change and shift, uh, shift over time. So um, other aspects, uh, other, I mean, one very significant uh, manifestation of uh, otherness in Byzantine material culture and art relates, of course, to religious other. And Korai, we can maybe pass to the next slide very quickly. So the, 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 um, the beliefs in Byzantium orthodoxy was, of course, was central, but uh, that does not exclude the presence of, uh, of other beliefs and, marg and, and religious groups that remained on the margins of orthodoxy, both spiritually and also physically in space and that Orthodox uh, Church tried to eradicate. So uh, interesting examples uh, come actually from Byzantine Phrygia and neighboring Lucaonia. So, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, the examples of uh, rock cut churches uh, and their very interesting decoration with crosses and even figurative sculpture uh, that has been attributed to various groups of uh, non-Orthodox uh, uh, communities. Uh, that might be one rare example of, uh, of, of material presence, artistic presence of, of of groups that uh, stayed really at the margin of orthodoxy and were even later eradicated. The same goes with, uh, with uh, this uh, Sanad uh, monastery uh, uh, near Konya uh, that might be uh, one very interesting case of, uh, of again, uh, marginal religious groups practicing asceticism, a monastery where men and women would have been uh, co cohabitating. So uh, these, these uh, archeological evidences of these particular places show the value of, uh, of archeological work to be done in many areas of Anatolia uh, and uh, what kind of evidence they bring about uh, these uh, long gone, uh, long gone uh, religious groups. Uh, the religious other in Byzantium uh, has always been the magic. Uh, and the contribution made by Henry Maguire tackles again this topic of the presence and place of magic. Uh, he looks in this article particularly uh, into everyday objects like ceramics, ceramic balls, and identifies certain decorative features, namely these circles and crosses as potentially uh, magical, magical signs, showing that uh, in everyday life, uh, one, one element that was fruiting and was permanent in Byzantium was always the magic, particularly the magic in domestic, uh, in the context of domestic life and everyday life. Uh, so, last set of contributions, Korai, can we move? Um, so, the last set of contributions dealt with uh, the identity and its manifestations through architectural patronage. And these include uh, three very interesting, I mean, very interesting contributions. Uh, so, the article by Scott Radford. Uh, about uh, madrasa, madrasa in Atabania, Sparta, Sparta that uh, a former, former Christian slave who converted to Islam uh, and became emir in Seljuk Sultanate. Uh, so uh, the, the design of that madrasa 
and the very, very prominent role that is given in to reuse of various Byzantine architectural and sculptural pieces makes this actually fascinating monument almost like a, a, you know a autobiography of uh, of its uh, of its pattern who whose multiple identities are actually almost expressed in this very hybrid and very interesting uh, decoration of uh, of the of the of the madrasa. Uh, two other examples. So the example uh, that comes from Armenia, uh, the, one of these neglected churches from the 10th century, who again by very elaborate architectural, sculptural decor and and inscriptions, could be also seen as a certain autobiography of its patron, uh, a known uh, bishop. Johannes, who had almost combined in through architectural decoration and sculpture uh, or expressed his vision of uh, Armenian past and Armenian Christianity. And the, the, third, the third slide relates to uh, the article of Suna Chaptai, who did not look at, at the, the case of uh, the patronage of one single person, which was the case in two earlier, contributions, but she looked at the Lascarit dynasty uh, and the, she, she questioned by looking at, again, architectural decoration, uh, sculpt, particular elements of architectural sculpture. She tried to understand the role Constantinople, but also local traditions and uh, models, architectural models that were coming from surrounding political entities in what kind of dialogue they were entering in monuments that uh, short-lived but yet very important 13th century Lascarid dynasty uh, produced. And the last slide, uh, Korai and... Uh, okay, and the last, uh, so the last uh, two contributions uh, uh, dealt with uh, objects, uh, objects of uh, like we could call it luxury or leisure. Uh, and they, uh, so the contributions of Alicia Walker and Brigitte Pitarakis, who looked at uh, production of, of, of Byzantine jewelry, uh, where uh, one actually sees uh, many interesting uh, uh, influences or, uh, or exchanges with uh, elements, with design uh, or particular techniques of production that were at that time uh, recurrent in the Islamic East. And they showed that actually through these objects, which were very personal, so these are now no longer monumental buildings, these are uh, personal adornments, uh, so objects that people were using and having very, very personal and tactile relation, uh, one one can think uh, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, meanings uh, the presence of Arabic script or the choice of particular ways of producing uh, these uh, this jewelry uh, made actually made the owners uh, made the owners aware. Uh, of their high status, or eventually, uh, we could even think of uh, of such objects as some kind of uh, social agents, cultural agents, who were actually uh, crossing the boundaries that we might think existed between Byzantine, Middle Byzantine, I mean Middle Byzantine court cultures and uh, the the Islamic East. So, just to conclude my part. Uh, by saying that uh, uh, the, certainly the book offers a lot of material and it's actually an invitation for all those who look at material and visual culture uh, to, to look at Byzantine material that is all around us. Uh, and just to keep in mind that uh, um, whatever Byzantines left, uh, it's a way for them to reach out to us through the past. 
and uh, by thinking how and what Byzantines did or how Byzantines were uh, dealing with questions of identity and the other, uh, when we look at and think of these questions in relation to the Byzantines, we are actually at the same time very much thinking of all of these questions and issues in relation to ourselves. So maybe between us and the Byzantines, uh, there is not so much of the, of the gap. <laughs> Uh, and they reach to us and in the way we, in a certain way, we reach to them too. So Korai, would you like to kind of conclude? Uh, thank you very much, Ivana, for this uh, very, uh, very nice introduc uh, introduction to the art historical material of the book. Well, uh, in lieu of a conclusion, I wanna say a few words about, again, as a historian of texts, about the discourse, because we, uh, the discourse we, we create the way in order to see the world and uh, manage ourselves in, in, in life. Well, uh, Jean-Francois Pazak has a very interesting way of putting it. He says, difference belongs to the realm of fact, while otherness belongs to the realm of discourse. So obviously we turn this, as, as, as it's stated here, we turn differences into otherness through a number of discourses. But of course, like there are many discourses on top of each other before a certain event or an object reaches from the past to us. An event from the past is filtered through the discourse of those who experience it, people who saw the event. And of course, they see they, they uh, see these, these events through certain identity discourses, like as a Turk, as a Muslim, as an Istanbulite, or as a Byzantine, you or one sees a certain event differently. But at the second level, certain people, in the case of Byzantium, intellectual elite, wrote down and preserved the memory of that event. They wrote down what this, they wrote down what other people saw. But of course, this intellectual elite probably had a different kind of discourse, part of the dominant acceptable discourse of Constantinopolitan discourse, for example, of the Orthodox discourse, for example, of the high-class elite discourse of Istanbul, for example. And obviously, at the third level, through the third filter, comes my own discourse. As Koray, as a modern Byzantinist, I read what the second-level people, the Byzantine intellectuals, wrote about a first-level event. And obviously, I have a certain understanding of my identities, and my othernesses I created, or my culture created for me. And finally, you, as the reader or the listener today, have your own in, uh, in identity sets, and together with it, certain ready-made discourses for you to find your way through. Obviously, uh, after going through this labyrinth of discourses, it comes almost like a Chinese whispers game in Turkish kulak tankula. And it's very difficult, it's gonna sound very postmodern, to reach the reality of that event in the past, if that was the purpose in the, the first instance. So what we as human beings or as Byzantines in the past do with, all, with, 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 with certain phenomena, do we just create discourses about the other, about like as Byzantines, Muslims, about heterodox Polishians, about Jews? Is it just a discursive intellectual uh, exercise? No, people, like the Byzantines, segregated the Jews or assimilated some of the Muslims or Jews. So there is the action part of it. And here comes, of course, the identity politics. Obviously, I wanna go back to the beginning of my presentation, of our presentation, and identity crisis is all around, I, coming with identity politics from Trump to Turkey. Uh, just like the late Byzantines, we are in anxiety, or maybe I should reverse the way I speak, just like uh, the late Byzantines who were anxiously trying to save their state and find an identity between the rising Turks and Serbs and the Westerners, we are in anxiety for our, our future and for our present and for our children, from whatever political section of the political spectrum you are. Uh, well, we are actually well, okay, some of them might be very political, uh, and some of these identity statements can be very personal or even uninformed. So today, we are surrounded by the dog-headed people, like 
let me just finish with this example of the Saint Christopher the Dockhead, who was a saint, who is a saint in both Western and Eastern Christianity. And the first sources come from the seventh and eighth centuries in Latin and Greek, are first evidence about this person. Apparently, he was a soldier in Libya, a Roman soldier in Libya in the late antique period. And he actually saw seeing how Christians were treated, mistreated, converted to Christianity. But he came from the land of the uh, monsters and dog-headed people. And therefore, uh, in the, in, as you can see in our book, uh, in the relevant article, uh, uh, he was described in the art historical evidence as a saint with a dog's head, occasionally, not always. Uh, and dog-headed people are everywhere. In Alexander's uh, East, according to Charlemagne, the Vikings were dog-headed people. And even Christophe Colomb tried to find uh, expected to find, at least not try, uh, dockheaded people when he set sail for the Americas. So, and obviously everybody sees dockheaded people around them. In modern times, immig immigrants, Syrians, covered people, LGBT people, these are all others for many different groups. I guess our success lies in our ability to turn these dockheaded monstrous races into Saint Christopher the Saints, because in the end, this dog-headed person became a holy saint in the culture of the Byzantines. Well, anyway, after this so much of a, like a presentist uh, conclusion, I'd like to say that our book can be found uh, at the bookstore uh, at Anamit. At your own risk, you can go to, <laughs> in, it, in COVID times, you can go to this, this at your own risk and buy the book. And I hope, I'm sure there is also like uh, an opportunity to buy it online, even though one of you wrote in the chat section that it, they are out of stock. So let's, let's see. Maybe in future, the book will be back online. Uh, so Ivana, would you like to add anything? Okay, so I will pass the then microphone from us to Vasiliki, uh, or maybe maybe we can, answer, try to answer the possible questions in the chat section, if there are any questions. I think the, the, the presentation will be uploaded to, to an online platform, possibly YouTube, right, Vasiliki? Yes, very correct. Uh, you can go through the questions now, if you would like. Um, if you go through the chat, there are many questions for you. Um, I can, whatever you prefer, I can read the questions to you or you can go through and answer them, uh, see them and answer them yourselves, whatever suits you best. Well, it, we need a few more seconds to see, uh, okay. to digest the questions. Let me uh, start with the first. What are the prospects of Byzantine art history studies as related to Byzantine paintings? Hmm. Well, I'm happy to, to, to answer and I'm very happy that there is a, such a question. Um, uh, so uh, the study of Byzantine paintings has been, let's say, a big topic in the 20th century. Uh, so uh, the first uh, travelers uh, in the Orthodox world and in Anatolia were making, you know, the albums recording very attentively uh, churches and their, uh, and their paintings uh, and produced, uh, let's say, very valuable documentation. Uh, so um, from there, uh, the studies of Byzantine paintings were very much based on iconography and something that is called stylistic study. Uh, now, uh, I think that Byzantine uh, paintings are studied in a much more, let's say, a much more compre comprehensive way. Uh, they are not seen, if we think of uh, Byzantine paintings like mural paintings, uh, they are not seen just as images. They are studied in uh, correlation to space where, where they are represented. Uh, many aspects uh, of, of, of them, uh, of their principles, pictorial principles, uh, also principles of how their narration 
uh, is organized has been highlighted in the past couple of years. So uh, the story, the aspect of storytelling, how, what, how, what stories and how Byzantine paintings tell the stories, how the viewers, uh, the believers uh, would, uh, would relate to them in concrete uh, space of the church. What is the role of uh, liturgy? Uh, what, is the, what is the role of patrons? Uh, how paintings were and programs were conceived? Uh, can we think of uh, figures that could be like advisors to patrons who were conceiving uh, uh, very complex uh, programs of paintings? And lastly, uh, one trend uh, in art history uh, now starts to see Byzantine paintings, not only just as visual decoration of the walls, but to, to, to think of them in correlation with the, the chanting, the sound, uh, the presence of people. So in what way uh, these images were part of, let's say, very living human experience of, uh, of walking, being in the church, participating in the, in the liturgy, uh, praying. So there are indeed a lot of, lot of uh, new prospects uh, on uh, the Byzantine art history offers. Uh, more, more, more and more studies now um, look at regions that until now did not get much attention. Uh, I'm in that sense uh, singling out the book of Sharon Gerstel on, uh, on, uh, on, on, the, on Morea in Peloponnese, where she looked at uh, a lot of villages and uh, their wall paintings and brought actually to life through wall paintings how all of these churches in, in a part that uh, we would say was some kind of a periphery were that were actually all those villages were connected with through their churches and actually through their paintings. So, but I don't want to monopolize uh, uh, the time with uh, the paintings. Uh, so, um, um, if you cover this question, I can continue with uh -huh. the next one. Yes. Uh, yeah. You mentioned earlier that uh, many researchers have so far fallen into the trap that Byzantine set. But seeing these ornaments, we see traces of a appropriation of others. So it's actually there. Weren't there any researchers or uh, even early chronicles who saw this merge and acceptance of the other on the part of Byzantines? You can also see the question on the chat. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm, 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 I'm thinking, uh, I'm <laughs> thinking how it's, it's a very good, uh, well, what is actually there? And um, uh, let's say that uh, also uh, the, the, the notions of uh, the processes of uh, appropriation uh, or uh, various groups of similar actually processes have also started to be, let's say, articulated and conceptualized in, uh, in cultural studies, I would say relatively recently. In the 80s and in the 90s, uh, none of these ornaments uh, were really started necessarily from the perspective that they were imitating something that is Arab, meaning that they were appropriating it. And at the end, it's not still, it's, it's something that is uh, hypothetical. Uh, when we look at the exchanges of certain visual forms, maybe the appropriation is not the only aspect. Uh, there might be a love for something that is exotic. Uh, one might see that inclusion of a new element or a technique that comes from somewhere far uh, elevates the status of what you are doing. So I would say that Appropriation is not necessarily the only way uh, one, one dialogues with the other. Korai, would you, I don't know, would you have something to add? Uh, about? The appropriation and whether Chronicles mention it. Uh, 
Yeah, but I mean, appropriation it, in historical sources is more difficult to trace because there is nobody talking like you no know, historian saying that this used to belong to the Muslims and we kind of like uh, appropriated it. But like, mostly, well, sometimes certain practices are taken over by the Byzantines from different people. Uh, and uh, some Byzantines saw this as an alien thing and reacted to it, saying that these tournaments that Manuel Komnenos in the 12th century is organizing it in the palace is a Western thing. And, you know, it's not Byzantine, it's not, it doesn't belong to us. And But some other practices, uh, phenomena, were without any uh, evidence in the sources, we don't have any trace in the sources, were appropriated by the Byzantines. So in that sense, I don't know, like I should think about specific examples uh, to try to answer this question. Uh, but uh, if you think about the longevity of the Byzantine Empire, 1200 years, more than 1200 mm -hmm. years, then obviously appropriation as a mechanism of adaptation, if I may say, uh, uh, worked quite well in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so adapting to the di different differing conditions, changing conditions, while not losing a number of of of, of major viewpoints that go back to back in time into the beginning of the Byzantine Empire. And also, when you just it is like just coming out from my head. Sorry, I'm just thinking loud. When you appropriate something, you don't appropriate uh, something for only one purpose. Like in Alicia Walker's article in our book. When she talks about the appropriation of certain Islamic symbols and elements in, in the material culture, uh, she underlines the, uh, very well that uh, these objects coming from the East or imitating uh, Eastern objects in, in the Byzantine context, they fulfilled multiple functions. When you wear an Islamizing or Islamic earring, uh, you, as a Byzantine lady, participate in the cosmopolitan culture of the Near East and the Middle Ages. You are aware of it, so it's global. But you also know that it's, it's produced by a Byzantine artist in Constantinople, so it's local. That's why, for example, Alicia Walker uses the term local, global and local at the same time. But also, for many Byzantines, using certain Islamizing or Islamic objects was a symbol of control and domination over Byzantium. Sorry, domination over Islamic world. Because you take over these objects from Islamic world and you appropriate them, and this way you subdue them. You subdue the business Islamic world to, uh, for your own purposes. So in that sense, appropriation might work in many directions, I guess. Um, so there are any other questions? Should I take yeah. some, one or two? Okay, so I, so, I mean... I, uh, may I choose? Please. Okay. Uh, Atta Uslu is asking, what are the major factors that shape discourses in a certain time and space? Do we usually observe an elite-oriented discourse, or can discourses emerge from ordinary people, ordinary events too? Well, it's not a specific to Byzantine studies. It's a, I guess it's more like a sociological, anthropologically-oriented question. But I would say that you one should ask who controls the channels of expression. It's a power relations issue. Who controls in modern times the media, huh? where people express themselves? Who controls the books? Who writes the books? Who reads the books? So it is inevitably, to some extent, I should say, especially for the Middle Ages, elite-oriented. I mean, the dominant discourse is elite-oriented because whatever evidence we have from the past came mostly through books in the written form, written by the elite, mostly. Also, art historical objects themselves, again, mostly mm -hmm. a kind of products of the elite environment, because also in the 19th and 20th century, many art historians defined art history, maybe earlier, as like, you know, best objects of a certain era, and who decides the best representative or objects of a certain era? The elite of that period decided, and the elite of today's uh, period continue that tradition. So it's like a, you know, um, a conservative tradition continuing. But of course, as uh, Atta said, there are occasional, uh, there are occasions where the subversive discourse, the discourse that is fighting the dominant, this dominant discourse, can find venues to express itself. In the Byzantine context, it can be a simple chronicle as opposed to a famous historical work written in Constantinople. A simple chronicle from the frontier, 
might reveal certain things about how frontiers people, frontier people felt like and lived like. And also obviously, you know, don't forget that the dominant discourse always tries to control the subversive groups ch channels in time. Like today, people use sub suppressed people or people who cannot find voice in the larger media, use other internet means, but the dominant discourse, the dominant political or cultural power comes and tries to imitate and dominate that so-called marginal channel as well. The second question is how Europeans de de identified Byzantium. Yeah, I mean, NS asks mm -hmm. like, how Europeans identified Byzantium and its people in general? It's a very long question. I can start and maybe Ivana can continue. Mm -hmm. But in a nutshell, I can say that in the 18th and 19th century, the Europeans, uh, modern, modernizing Europeans, didn't see Byzantium in a very positive light, neither its uh, mm -hmm. literature nor its uh, art historical uh, art, uh, artist production, because Byzantium was uh, too much of an Eastern culture. It wasn't Catholic or Protestant. It belonged to the Slavic world mm -hmm. and the Greek world. Uh, and it was destroyed by the Ottomans and other Oriental people. So actually, Byzant Byzantium was viewed in in the light in, in within the limits of the Orientalist discourse. So definition of Ottomans and description of Ottomans and description of Byzantines by a 19th century European French intellectual didn't differ much. Corrupt, rich, decadent, uh, and poor people that belonged to the past that didn't go through Renaissance, Reformation, modernity, etc. But of course, we are political presentist animals, and 21st century people now in the postmodern light do not think in terms of East versus the West, or West, sorry, West versus the East. So therefore, Byzantium has acquired uh, a, a, a new interest. A more, in, it's seen in, in more positive light because European Union has expanded into the Slavic, Russian, and the Greek world. Uh, because people are, have less of a, like a, you know Western Christian identities, but more living or expressing more secular concerns, people are more interested in non-Western, non-democratic, non-modernized uh, cultures. So they are more open to Madagascar culture, and they are more open to Byzantine culture as well. You know, to learn it. So I, that's in a nutshell what I would say. Would you like to add something, Ivana, to this question? Uh, yes, the, um, the um, what you what you uh, kind of you know described in this broke uh, in this broad uh, brush brush strokes uh, applies very much to also evaluations of uh, of Byzantine art uh, that was for a long time uh, seen as uh, static, uh, monotonous. Uh, the points for which Byzantine art would have been valued was you know the movements or uh, artworks where the influence of uh, greek roman art was uh, was very obvious so the the byzantine art was sometimes uh, uh, valued uh, because it preserved um, elements uh, from uh, greek or roman uh, pictorial and artistic tradition so uh, sometimes so these aspects of continuity uh, with uh, Greek and Roman art and architecture that exist were actually seen as uh, the most valuable uh, point uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Byzant Byzant Byzantine art. Uh, so um, it, I think it's only in the, in the, in, in the second half of the, of the 20th century, mostly, where uh, this uh, multiplicity of, of, uh, of Byzantine art, uh, great variety of its artistic practices. Uh, so not just icons and wall paintings, but many other forms of architecture, uh, material culture, objects, uh, so-called minor arts, uh, they actually brought to life uh, something much, much more vibrant and uh, interesting than you know seeing Byzantine art as uh, an art that is valuable because it uh, preserved the uh, Greek or Roman heritage. Yeah. So uh, there is one more question. I think it's from Nathan. It is quite interesting and difficult to answer mm -hmm. because I was expecting it. Like, uh, <laughs> what has changed? What has been contributed to the study of identity in Byzantine studies since 2016? Drawing our attention to the fact that the conference was held like 
four years ago mm -hmm. and the book uh, two a year ago, I guess, not, not that old. Well, uh, I can give you some answers here and there, some disparate, kind of a disparate uh, set of answers. Uh, for, I think the trends I tried to describe uh, after the spatial turn and cultural turn and post-structural turn, an emphasis on uh, space, an emphasis on, um, uh, on, on, on fluidity of identities continue today in the last four or five mm -hmm. years. For example, at Dumberton Oaks, there is a new conference on masculinity. It's not about woman, it's not about men, it's about uh, the identity, it's not identity, but performance actually of manhood, masculinity, right? Uh, it's not performance as expected by the society and as negotiated by us, the individuals, me in the men's form as for us. Uh, so uh, another interesting meeting point of identity and the new trends are network studies. So modern Byzantinists are working on uh, identities, trying to discover the, more about the identities of certain Byzantines through their networks. So what kind of a social environment did they create in their networks in business, in their networks of writing letters? So network theories from, borrowed from sociological studies uh, are used in order to understand the social identity of the, of the Byzantines. And also, uh, well, uh, sadly, uh, I'm going to finish my part of the answer by referring to sadly to the uh, 24th Byzantine Studies Congress, mm -hmm. uh, which was supposed to be held in Istanbul, but for a various of reasons, including lack of support uh, from, the, from the state, unfortunately, recently, uh, which is, it is moved from Istanbul, uh, which was supposed to take place in 2021, to Italy. Uh, but the program will be there, and uh, still, Turkish Committee's program will mostly, I think, uh, will be implemented in Italy, together with contributions from the Italian uh, Committee. Uh, and there, the main subject is Byzantium as a bridge. It's not only, I guess, a, a, a motto by, a, you know, almost like a tourism ministry, Istanbul, uh, <laughs> between two continents, but also it sh mm -hmm. shows us, like, uh, identities are multiple and fluid, and especially locations and occasions where uh, different groups, different cultural circles met, uh, draw more attention from modern Byzantinists. For example, there I'm, I, I hope I will give a talk at that Congress about multiple identities of different Byzantines. We always try to see Byzantines as like Byzantine diplomats. They go to Baghdad to perform their duty as diplomats. But did they only act as diplomats there? I mean, the more so, the more we read, the more we realize that the, the diplomats also went there to do trade and vice versa. Some merchants were, uh, were, 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 were uh, diplomats and some pilgrims were merchants. So it's not like, it's, it's not easy to define one Byzantine person, individual as a diplomat, a soldier. People engaged in multiple businesses and, and also therefore carried multiple, identi uh, multiple identities. Ivana, would you like to add to this question? Uh, just yes, possible new uh, direction. So um, certainly uh, new technologies uh, can help uh, all those who look at material and visual culture uh, uncover, uh, let's say, new new elements that can bring uh, possible answers to these questions. Uh, so uh, the, the digital world uh, that makes now new material available to us, uh, various uh, possibilities that are offered now by 3D modeling, uh, more of uh, proper archaeological work, also reconstructions, uh, restorations that are properly documented. Um, all of them uh, allow, uh, can allow us to, to, to actually uh, understand uh, past vestiges that came to us. Uh, we are very often bound by uh, the lack of uh, proper perspectives. And in that sense, uh, augmented reality, all you know, VR, ER, uh, can be uh, very helpful in, uh, in assessing this uh, visual and material uh, culture. And then uh, it can allow us uh, 
to, to ask maybe better questions about uh, the identity and the otherness. Uh, so I also see, I think, uh, uh, Melis, you are uh, you are one of our students, coach students. Uh, so you ask uh, about uh, recommendation of uh, resources and studies about historical identity. Um, uh, so if you want, Korai and I can maybe make such a list and send you. <laughs> it would be too long, maybe to to answer that uh, to answer that now. Uh, so, so you ask uh, the relations between ancient Greeks and Romans, uh, and I mean how uh, ancient and Greek Roman past, how 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 they related to Byzantium. That's also a very big question. So, Karayu, should we take? It? I mean, we can. I mean, Melissa, I am also very happy to answer uh, on uh, yeah when we have the opportunity to see each other via via Zoom. Maybe mm -hmm. not stand that now. Are we tiring our listeners already? Uh, the numbers are decreasing among the participants, I noticed. So I think we, you know, uh, over talked. <laughs> uh, Vasiliki, would you like to add anything? Or Ivana, uh, his final words? I see a question about uh, how crusades affected identity. So again, one uh, one very I mean, uh, so all, uh, so historical uh, periods when uh, more interaction took place, whether through you know when movement of people, whether through military campaigns and wars, uh, where it was also followed with, uh, with of course, merchants, traders, <laughs> as, uh, uh, technicians of all kind uh, who were part of these, uh, of these uh, important uh, um, military campaigns. So all of that uh, certainly is uh, reflected in, uh, in very complex sets of identities that are actually produced uh, in the period of Crusades. I think, Korai, we start talking about 11 times, actually from that period onwards. So mm -hmm. the, the, the Westerners who you know, go to the East, who settle there, uh, who, who, who marry, uh, so all these marriage, uh, various marriage combinations, uh, that uh, make these people uh, no longer only, you know, Westerners or not just uh, maybe Muslims or no longer just Byzantines. So there we come with uh, very hybrid identities uh, that were very much reflected in, in arts of that uh, period, which is very interesting to look at. It is also reflected in the written sources and certain subgenres of, of the written world in Byzantium, areas of the Latins, were, were written in the 10th and 11th centuries, especially 11th century, uh, which is like a response to the Latin church's rising dominance. And it should be read in together with the crusaders and Westerners arriving to the East. And in the 12th century, uh, there were many anti-Latin uh, treatises written in Byzantium mm -hmm. in response to not only crusaders, but also uh, as well as to the, to the uh, Latins, Italians, uh, Dominic slowly dominating the economy of the empire and the city. So the Byzantines were very well aware of the presence of these Westerners who used to be much poorer and invisible in the middle Byzantine period. And there was almost nobody speaking Latin or reading Latin in, nobody, but fewer people speaking Latin and reading Latin in ninth and 10th century Constantinople. And now you have Latins in 12th century Constantinople living, forming neighborhoods in, within the city. So obviously, it's no coincidence that the late Byzantine identity, especially late Byzantine identity term, Helene, acquiring a more positive meaning uh, rather than meaning pagan uh, and ancient Greek, now meaning we, the Hellenes, like the Byzantines. I guess this transition from the negative to meaning to a positive meaning has also something to do with the need to differentiate themselves from the Westerners who also called themselves Romans. I mean, in other words, Byzantines called themselves Romans and Italians called themselves to some extent Romans at this church. Therefore, the Byzantines needed to differentiate themselves from the Westerners. Another term, so some, few if not a lot, uh, intellectuals started experimenting with the term Helene. 
um, so especially in the later Byzantine period. So I guess obviously the presence of the Westerners in different forms, whether crusaders mm -hmm. or merchants or orders, mendicant orders and others uh, coming to the East. And as uh, Ivana said, uh, mm -hmm. presence of the political entities in Antioch, uh, Urfa and Levant, obviously triggered a discussion. And even again, my favorite word, identity crisis among the Byzantines. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess this is the end. We can try to go through the questions again and try to answer these people individually, especially if they're looking for sources and for secondary or primary. But other than that, I personally like to thank everybody who listened to us almost an hour and a half, uh, <laughs> who were bearing with us. Uh, and I wish you a, a healthy, uh, mentally and physically healthy period uh, of winter. Yes. Same, same from my side. Healthy, healthy, healthy fall. Healthy fall. Stay well, and if you're brave, courageous enough to go to Istiklal, uh, in in the small uh, bookstore corner of Anamed, you can uh, you can find yes, you can find the book. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you Vasya. Thank you, thank you, you Ivan and Koray, very much for your participation today, and thank you all very much for attending. Uh, the recording of the talk will be uploaded soon on uh, our SoundCloud account. And there are also plans uh, to add the videos on our YouTube channel, but this will be later on. There will be announcements. We will close the year with one more talk on December 1st with uh, Leslie Pierce from New York University and her recent publication, Empress of the East, How a European Slave Girl Became Queen of the Ottoman Empire, the true history of an elusive figure who transformed the Ottoman harem into an institution of imperial rule. Good evening, everyone.